Well, thank you, Mike, so much for that very gracious introduction, and thank you all for being here today. The truth is, I do not want to be the most powerful woman in the world. The truth is, I do come before you wanting to be the leader of what should be the most powerful nation in the world. And I think actually it's a really important distinction. When I was a young woman, typing and filing and answering the phones for that little nine-person real estate firm, I thought that a leader was someone who had a big office or a big title or a big parking space or lots of perks or maybe lots of power. And as I went on in my life and got a little bit older and wiser, I came to learn that there were people with big offices, big titles, lots of power who were not leading at all. Because you see, leadership isn't actually about those things. Although sometimes those things can help a leader. Leadership is not about position or title or power. The highest calling of leadership is to unlock potential in others. And we need a leader now in the Oval Office who will work with the citizens of this great nation to unlock the potential of this, the most blessed nation on the face of the earth. I learned that maybe a long time ago also when I was that young woman typing and filing and I had no plan for what I was going to do with my life. I was just happy to be earning a living because I was a young woman and I had graduated with a degree in medieval history and philosophy. And Mike was kind. I didn't even make it through a single semester at law school. So that didn't look really good on a resume. So I was just happy to be working. And about six months into that job, two men who worked in that little nine-person real estate firm came to my desk and said to me, you know, we've been watching you, and we think you could do more than type and file and answer the phones. Do you want to know what we do? And that was my introduction to business. But it was more than that, actually. Looking back on it, I now know that that was my introduction to leadership. Because you see, those two men saw possibilities in me. And because they saw possibilities in me, I saw potential in myself. And suddenly, I saw a whole different world open up in front of me. Every single one of us have someone like that in our lives. For me, it wasn't just those men, it was my mother and dad. My mother told me one Sunday morning, when I was a little girl, she looked at me and said, what you are is God's gift to you. What you make of yourself is your gift to God. So she promised me that somewhere I had God-given gifts. And she and my father challenged me to find and use those God-given gifts. All of you have had people like that in your life. People who've seen possibilities in you, who've taken a chance on you, who've given you a helping hand. We all need that in our lives, regardless of our circumstances. I'm running for the presidency of the United States because I think we have come to a pivotal point where literally the possibilities for too many Americans, indeed the potential of this great nation, is being crushed. Crushed by the weight, the power, the cost, the complexity, the ineptitude, and the corruption of a federal government out of control and a professional political class that refuses to do anything about it. But we can do something about it. Ours was intended to be a citizen government. We, the citizens of this great nation, must now take our government back. I have traveled and lived and worked all over the world. I have done business work, charity work, policy work. I've met more world leaders on the stage today than anyone running with the possible exception of Hillary Clinton or maybe Joe Biden, but I didn't do photo ops with these people. I did business and charity and policy work. And because of that experience, I am keenly aware that it is only in this nation that a young woman can start out typing and filing and answering the phones in the middle of a deep recession, go on one day to become the chief executive of the largest technology company in the world and run for the presidency of the United States. That is only possible here. 
And it's possible here, I think, because our founders knew that every life is filled with potential and possibilities. Our founders knew what my mother taught me. Everybody has God-given gifts. And if you think about it, our founders built a nation on this idea. The idea was that here you had the right, that's how they expressed it, a right to find and use your God-given gifts and fulfill your potential. They expressed this right as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But what they meant was you can create possibilities for yourself. You can fulfill your potential. You can find and use your God-given gifts. You can build a life of dignity and purpose and meaning. And the radical part of that idea, and it was radical at the time, and it's unique and visionary still, is they said that right comes from God and cannot be taken away by man or government. And today, at this pivotal point, the right for anyone in this nation, regardless of their circumstances, to find and use their God-given gifts and fulfill their potential is being taken away. You know, I'm struck by the fact that I campaign all over the place. And I have something of a reputation for taking any question, answering any question. I've been asked all kinds of questions. I've been asked, is a hot dog a sandwich? I don't know. What do you think? It's a burning question, apparently, to some. I've been asked if a woman's hormones prevent her from serving in the Oval Office. Really? I was. On national television. My answer, by the way, was, huh, can we think of any instance in which a man's judgment might have been clouded by his hormones? <laughs> I've been asked why I'm a Republican. And my answer has been, because I know that no one of us is any better than any other one of us. Each of us are gifted by God. All of us have the capacity to live a life of dignity and purpose and meaning. And I know our values, our principles, and our policies work better to lift everyone up. Progressives don't believe that. Progressives actually believe some are smarter than others, some are better than others, some are going to take care of others. But in the course of answering all these questions, I've had people come up to me and say, you know, thank you for answering my question. Thank you for talking in common sense. Thank you for speaking in language that I can understand. And I have often thought, what a low bar that is. I mean, think about it. What a low bar it is. American people, too many people in America are surprised when someone answers a question specifically and talks in language we can all understand. This is why, ladies and gentlemen, 82% of the American people now think we have a professional political class that is more concerned with the preservation of its own power, position, and privilege in both parties than on actually getting anything done. And it's also why 75% of the American people now think the federal government is corrupt. That's a strong word, but Gallup has been asking that question for two decades. And the answer, 75% of the people give, yes, the federal government has become corrupt, is the highest level they have seen in all those decades. In other words, the American people have started to figure this out. It ain't working anymore. It's not working. Think about it. Whatever your issue, whatever your cause, whatever your party, whatever festering problem you hoped would be resolved by now, it ain't resolved. How long have we been talking about securing the border? 25 years, actually. With all due respect to Mr. Trump, he did not bring this issue up. We have been talking about it every election for the last four. We talked about it in 2012. We talked about it in 2008. We talked about it in 2004. And yet, 25 years later, the border remains insecure. How long have we been talking about bipartisan tax reform? Forever. And yet our tax code is now 73,000 pages long. In every election cycle, politicians roll out tax plans, and yet they never happen. How long have we been talking about reforming Social Security or Medicaid? I don't know, the last four election cycles that I recall, and yet it never happens. 
Remember 18 months ago when we were all shocked and outraged that the Veterans Administration had allowed veterans in Arizona to die before they got an appointment? And we learned that the bureaucrats at that hospital were cooking the books, so nobody found out. Remember how outraged we all were? And so the citizens of this nation flooded Capitol Hill with complaints, and Capitol Hill responded because politicians do respond to pressure. It just has to be intense, consistent pressure applied over time. Politicians responded, and in three short weeks, demonstrating that politicians can, in fact, get something done. In three short weeks, the politicians signed, passed, a bipartisan bill. President Obama signed it. And the bipartisan bill said we could fire 400 senior executives at the VA if they didn't do their jobs. Now, by the way, how many people you suppose have been fired? One. Actually, one. The exception that proves the rule, sadly. But a month ago, we learned that 356,000 veterans have died prior to receiving health care. So nothing's better. In fact, it's worse. And you haven't heard much from the political class. It reminds me of the difference between managers and leaders. You see, managers are people who do the best they can within the status quo. Managers tinker around the edges of problems. Managers never really challenge the system. They just operate within the system. It doesn't mean they're bad people. It's just they never actually say, you know what, this isn't working anymore. We've got to change the system. And so they tinker. There are managers in business. There are managers in life. There are managers in politics. But leadership is not about tinkering. A leader challenges the status quo. A leader solves problems, produces results. People once ask me, frequently ask me, how did you go from secretary to CEO? And the answer is, I didn't have a plan to do that. But I ran to problems instead of running away from them. And every time I ran to a problem, I found people who knew how to solve it. It's just they'd never been asked. And so we would challenge the status quo, and we would shake up the system. We would produce results, and we would solve problems. And that's what's going to have to happen in Washington, D.C. And citizens of this great nation are going to have to participate in that process. So let me just tell you a couple things. We need to go to zero-based budgeting. We need to know where every single dollar of your money is being spent because that's the only way that we can actually spend less, which we desperately need to do, and also invest in those things that need more investment. Have you ever wondered why the federal government spends more money year after year after year? By the way, we do. The federal government spends more money every year, has been doing so for 50 years, and yet the federal government never has enough money to do what it's supposed to do. Build roads and bridges, we need more money. Secure the border, we need more money. Care for our veterans, we need more money. Answer your taxpayer questions on tax day, we need more money. How is it possible that you spend more money year after year after year and never have enough? That's why we need to go to some version of zero-based budgeting so we know where the money is being spent and we can prioritize and we have to have some version of a meritocracy so that people actually can be fired for dereliction of duty because it's not okay that 356,000 veterans die waiting for health care and there are no consequences. So how are you going to get those things done? I'll tell you how I'm going to get them done. I'm going to call on you, the citizens of this great nation, to help me get it done. Technology is a wonderful thing, you know? Technology has transformed your industry. Well, technology can re-engage people in the process of their government. So I'm going to ask you once a week in a weekly radio address to please take out your smartphones. Anybody still own a flip phone here? Okay, you don't have to fess up now, but I'm just saying you need to upgrade. <laughs> I'm going to ask the American citizens to take out their smartphones, and I might ask you a really basic question like, do you believe it's important that we know where every dollar of your money is being spent? Press one for yes, two for no. This technology exists. It will put a lot of pressure on the political system. Do you think there ought to be consequences for a failure to do your job in the government? You know, we know. We know. We get Inspector General reports every three or four months that says in yet another government agency, you can watch pornography all day long and earn the same pay, pension, and benefits as somebody trying to do a good job. We know this goes on. Does anything happen? No. 
So I might ask, do you think it's important that there are consequences in the federal government if you fail to do your job? Just like if there are consequences in every other job, press one for yes, two for no. Leadership and citizenship can solve every problem we have. All of our wounds are self-inflicted. We need leadership in the world as well, not just to challenge the status quo and unlock the potential of this great nation, but we need leadership in the world because the world's a really dangerous, tragic place when we are not leading. And if you doubt that, think about the events of the last several days. In the last several days, we have learned that Russia, Syria, Iran, and Iraq have gathered together in an unholy alliance. And our president and our foreign uh, our Secretary of State did not know about it, even though they were engaged in conversations with Russia at the time. That is a demonstration of weakness, ladies and gentlemen. And at the same time, we learned that the President of the United States is beseeching the Pope to intercede with the Iranian leader to help free four Americans that have been trapped in Iranian jails. Meanwhile, we have been negotiating with the Iranians for 18 months. And so people need to see that we are prepared to lead again. We must have the strongest military on the face of the planet. Everybody has to know it. And I know precisely what that takes. It will take an investment in brigades and battalions and battleships and the nuclear triad. But it also will require a very clear message to the world that we're going to stand with allies and confront adversaries. And so on day one in the Oval Office, I will make two phone calls. The first will be to my good friend Bibi Netanyahu to reassure him that we will stand with the state of Israel always. And every, <laughs> and every ally we have, whether they agree with Israel or not, will know exactly what that means because every ally we have in the world, including our Arab allies are watching how we are treating Israel and concluding our friendship with the United States of America doesn't mean very much. And the second phone call will be to the Supreme Leader of Iran. I don't think I'm quite his cup of tea, so he might not take my phone call. But he will get my message. And the message is this. New deal. I don't care what deal you signed with the former president of the United States, there is a new deal. And here it is. Until you open every nuclear and every military facility to real, anytime, anywhere inspections by our people, not yours, the United States of America is going to make it as difficult as possible for you to move money around the global financial system. We can do that. We don't need anyone's permission to do it. We don't need anyone's collaboration to do it. And we must do it. We must stop the money flow. Because the Iranians are using the money to sow murder and mayhem throughout the Middle East and to build their nuclear and their military capabilities. And with those two phone calls, ladies and gentlemen, the message will go out around the world loud and clear. The United States of America is back in the leadership business. Nowhere is this crushing load of government and this lack of leadership and this destruction of possibilities for Americans more clear than in your industry. You are in an industry characterized by innovation and entrepreneurship. This industry, we can be, the United States of America can be the global energy powerhouse of the 21st century. We have the know-how, we have the resources, you have the dedication. And why are we not? Because government prevents it, pure and simple. The government of the nation of the United States is preventing us from being the global energy powerhouse of the 21st century. And meanwhile, what are we providing the bad guys? We are providing the bad guys with an opportunity to be even badder. Because Iran, Russia, whoever wants to be in the energy business, China, we're giving them a runway. We're going to allow Iran to export oil, but we will not permit the United States of America to export oil and energy. That is a self-inflicted wound. Now, by the way, you will hear, as you hear all the time, you will hear people say, well, we, we can't let that happen. We can't let that happen because of global warming and climate change. In fact, I was asked by a reporter earlier today, well, what do you think about climate change? Climate change is being used as the reason why the possibilities of this industry are being crushed. And of course, 
if we were the global energy powerhouse of the 21st century, we will be under President Fiorina, what would we be doing? What would you be doing? You'd be creating millions of jobs, you'd be growing our GDP, you'd be making our foreign policy more robust because the bad guys wouldn't have the same runway we're giving them today, but no, we can't do that because of climate change. So I challenge all of my friends and colleagues who talk to me about climate change, read the fine print. If you read these scientific reports all the way through, not just what the media says, what you're going to find is all the scientists who tell us that global warming, climate change is man-made and real, they will also say that with current technology, it will take a concerted global effort coordinated over 30 years costing trillions of dollars to make any difference at all. In other words, with current technology, the United States can literally destroy our energy industry, and it won't make any difference. Except, of course, to all the jobs, the livelihoods we've destroyed, and the communities we've destroyed, and the bad guys that we have given more opportunity to be bad. It'll make a big difference to them, but it won't make any difference. And so we are sacrificing jobs, livelihoods, communities, the EPA is systematically trying to destroy the coal industry, now the oil and gas industry. They're trying, I think, whether they realize it or not, to destroy agriculture because the EPA now controls 99% of the groundwater in this nation. That's a bad thing. I can tell you, having lived in California, all of that, those livelihoods, those communities are being sacrificed not at the altar of science, but at the altar of ideology. Every wound we have is self-inflicted. Because we could lift all of that and become the global energy powerhouse of the 21st century pretty quickly, actually. You know that even better than I do. Every problem we have can be solved. None of these problems take rocket science. They do take common sense, good judgment, citizenship, and leadership. And so I will close with this thought before I take your questions. One of the great heroes of mine is Margaret Thatcher. And Margaret Thatcher once addressed her nation at a pivotal point in her nation's history, and she said this, I am not content to manage the decline of a great nation. Well, neither am I. I think we have been managing the decline of this great nation for far too long. I am prepared to lead the resurgence of a great nation. I will need your votes, your support, your financial support, your moral support, your prayers, but I will also need your active citizenship. I think to understand what we can be in the 21st century, we have to remember who we are intended to be. We have to remember who we are as a nation, a nation where every American has the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But I think to tell us who we are, we need only look to two of the most powerful symbols of our nation's democracy, Lady Liberty and Lady Justice. Picture Lady Liberty in your minds. Lady Liberty stands tall and strong, as America must always be. She is clear-eyed and resolute. She doesn't shield her eyes from the realities of the world or the evils of the world, but she nevertheless faces out into the world, which is the way we must always face. And she holds her torch very high because she knows she is a beacon of hope in a very troubled world. And Lady Justice, Lady Justice holds a sword by her side because she's a fighter, she's a warrior for the values and the principles that have made this nation great. She holds a scale. And with that scale, she is saying to us, reminding us that all of us are equal in the eyes of God. And so all of us need to be equal in the eyes of the law and government, powerful and powerless alike. And she wears a blindfold. And with that blindfold, I think she says that it must be true. It can be true that in this nation, in this century, it doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how you start. It does not matter your circumstances. Here in this nation, every American's life must be filled with the possibilities that come from their God-given gifts. And we must be 
one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so very much, ladies and gentlemen. Carly, thank you. Uh, we're going to go ahead, right here in front of you. Oh, there you are. We're going to go ahead and get started with some questions. I thought it might kick us off. As you highlighted in your speech, it's really through uh, innovation and technology that we've really unlocked an energy renaissance in the United States. I would like to know from your side, with, with all the technology that's been used, we really feel from an industry's perspective that there's been tremendous regulatory overreach in trying to uh, really pull back that innovation from the United States. So what would you do as President of the United States in order to really unlock the future of energy production in this country? Well, first, of course, it's true. I mean, the EPA is rolling out rule after rule after rule. And it's worth thinking about for a moment this. We were intended to be a nation of laws. We have become a nation of rules. The EPA is a bureaucracy. They are elected by no one. They are accountable to no one. And unfortunately, most of the rules that the EPA, the FCC, the National Labor Relations Board are rolling out right now are being rolled out along purely partisan lines. In other words, this is about the application of rules according to a ideology. And the EPA has decided that their ideology, which is not founded in science, ladies and gentlemen, that their ideology calls for the destruction of certain industries, the destruction of coal, the destruction of oil and gas. I've been in coal mining communities. Maybe you have too. I have seen what 40% unemployment looks like. I have seen what it looks like when people whose families have been in the coal mining business for generations, who have been proud to power America, are told by their government, what you do is evil, we're not gonna let you do it anymore. The truth is, all of these regulations have to be rolled back, not because we don't want to be good stewards of our planet. Of course we want to be good stewards of our planet. But we have to understand that the only way to solve intractable problems is by innovation. That's how we always solve intractable problems. Meanwhile, while we are destroying our own coal industry, just as one example, or stopping the oil and gas industry from exporting, we are watching as China fires up four or five new coal-powered plants every single week, and Iran is about to start exporting oil. We are shooting ourselves in the head and the foot, and it is not because of science. It is because of ideology and an unaccountable bureaucracy. And so we need to start rolling all of this back, and we need to make sure that any single rule that is proposed for this nation has to have congressional oversight. That's why I've called on the Congress to pass the RAINS Act, which actually gives Congress the authority, as they should have it, to look at the regulation and determine whether it makes sense or not. It's not that there's no role for government, but for heaven's sakes, the government has become a crushing weight. All of those agencies, 400 pages of regulation over the internet, rolled out by the FCC on purely partisan lines. How do you suppose that's going to turn out? The National Labor Relations Board on purely partisan lines, just because they decided it was time, decided to change a hundred-year-old definition of a franchisor and a franchisee because they have a political agenda. The good news is people have started to figure this out. It's why 82% of the American people think the professional political class doesn't work for them anymore. And it's why 75% of the American people think the federal government is corrupt, picking winners and losers to feather their own nests instead of to serve the people who pay for the government. If you let me bring the mic to you before you ask your question. Some people are quick to question your leadership and your ability to execute strategy during your tenure at HP. Um, I personally feel like you have the qualities of transformational leader, and I know you kind of touched on it earlier, but how else do you defend against um, that and your ability to execute your platform when you are president, hopefully? You know, one of the things that's interesting, somebody once asked me, 
what's the difference between business and politics? And thank you for asking that question, by the way. What's the difference between business and politics? And here's the difference. Politics is a fact-free zone. I'm pe people just say things. People just say things. The thing is, business is not a fact-free zone. In fact, business is a fact-filled zone. So as chief executive of Hewlett Packard, I had to stand every 90 days and defend our results in excruciating detail. And if I misrepresented those results in any way, I could be held criminally liable. Now just suppose for a moment that anyone else running for president was held criminally liable for what they said. So here's some facts about my record. I was recruited. I was recruited. I wasn't looking for a job. I was recruited by the board of Hewlett Packard because that company was falling behind. They had no strategy. They had a culture that had become stultified, a vast hulking bureaucracy. They were falling behind in every product and every market. And in technology, if you are lagging, you are losing. And so they needed transformation. I also happened to coincide, my six-year tenure at Hewlett Packard happened to coincide with the worst technology recession in 25 years. The NASDAQ dropped 80%. It's taken 15 years for it to recover, and many of our strongest competitors literally disappeared, taking every job with them because they did not make the tough calls necessary to survive. And yet, despite those tough times, we took a company that was lagging behind and turned it into a leader in every product and every market category. We not only doubled the size of the company, we quadrupled its top line growth rate, which is hard to do in a recession. We quadrupled its cash flow. We tripled its rate of innovation to almost 15 patents a day. We saved 80,000 jobs. We went on to grow to 150,000 jobs. Ladies and gentlemen, I will run on that track record all day long. And by the way, By the way, I think the citizens of this great nation actually are looking for someone to go into the White House and make a tough call occasionally, actually make a decision, actually cut a bureaucracy down to size. At the end of my six-year tenure, I got fired in a boardroom brawl that lasted for two weeks. And you know why? Because when you lead, when you challenge the status quo, you make enemies. It is why people don't lead. It's hard. I made some enemies. And... I got fired over a matter of principle that I didn't think board members should take their disputes with me into the press. But interestingly, a couple weeks ago, the man who led my ouster, a gentleman named Tom Perkins, took out an op-ed in the New York Times, paid for a full-page ad, I didn't know he was going to do it, and said, I was wrong, she was right, she was a great CEO, the board was dysfunctional, she's going to make a magnificent president of the United States, and I'll back her all the way. Thank you so much for coming to Oklahoma. I have one quick question. Will you sign the Trans-Canada Keystone Pipeline Agreement? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Talk about a self-inflicted wound. How long did it take Hillary Clinton to finally take a position on this? Two years. And notice how she parsed her language. She said she wasn't going to sign it because she thought it would complicate our efforts to fight climate change. Why do you suppose she used that word? Because the facts are these. The facts are these. What we're doing now to transport that oil is far worse for global warming, far higher levels of global greenhouse gas emissions than if we built the pipeline. But she couldn't admit that because that would say it's ideology, not science, not fact. So she had to use the word complicate. Of course I'll sign it. A million point two jobs. By the way, you're going to hear lots of Democrats criticize my record, Hillary Clinton among them. Mrs. Clinton has never created a job. She has never saved a job, and her policies destroy jobs day after day after day, including this decision. 1.2 million jobs. Thank you very much, Mrs. Clinton. There's a gentleman up here. Uh-oh, we're going to have a feedback here. Uh, Mrs. Fiorina, the contest uh, will not come down to polls, but delegates. Uh, I have no knowledge of your ground organization and how much uh, 
energy and resources that you've put into that, especially in the early primary states. Can you uh, enlighten us on that, please? So what a great question. That says, gee, I really want you to win. I want to know that you know how to win. Thank you for that question, sir. <laughs> we have always imagined this to be a long game. And it's going to be a process of elimination before it's a process of selection. And just to let you know, when I launched my campaign on May 4th, less than 3% of the American voters had ever heard my name or knew I was running for president. In other words, I had really low name ID. And when I went to the Fox News debate on August 6th, less than 40% of voters had ever heard my name or knew I was running for president. And when I went to the CNN debate, 50% had never heard my name and didn't know I was running for president. And yet, we already were in the top five in the polls. Now, of course, my name ID is up, in part because the stage collapsed on me the other day, but <laughs> nobody was hurt. But with the lowest name ID in the field still, I am number two or number three in all the national polls and in the statewide polls. So what does that tell you? It tells you that people want a leader who can get things done. It also tells you that when people hear me and see me and listen to me, they tend to support me. Long before people knew who I was, we were out doing the groundwork necessary to win. So whether that's building a ground game in the early primary states, don't you worry, we are. I have been traveling to the state of Ohio and uh, Iowa and New Hampshire, just as two examples, for over a year. I've made more trips than most candidates. And we also are doing things like funding ballot access in all 50 states. Ladies and gentlemen, I can win this job. I need your support. I need your votes. I need your prayers. But I can win this job. And if you care about your industry, you need me to win this job. But once I've won the job, more importantly, I can do the job. Because the job needs doing now. Oh, this is a hot dog as a sandwich question. By the way, wait, show of hands, how many people think a hot dog's a sandwich? You see there? How many, how many people think a hot dog isn't a sandwich? I'm in that camp. You see? Okay. Thank you for proving the point. I said no. Go ahead. So you need one of those hot dogs. Right. So um, I remember the last election cycle, Barack Obama sang some R&B song and everybody, he, was, he did a decent job. Then Mitt Romney <laughs> did a... Kind of, a, kind of a poor rebuttal to that where he tried to sing God Bless America and it was pretty sad. I saw you on Jimmy Fallon's show and you've, you've got an excellent singing voice. <laughs> and uh -oh. I just, do you think you can outsing Hillary or Joe Biden? Do I think I can what? Could outsing them. Oh. I'm thinking you could. Well, I don't know, but I have to tell you that my dog Max is feeling really left out right now. Because Snickers is getting all the glory. And you know, Max has his own song, and then they have a song for the two of them. My granddaughters love all this. No, I will not sing this to you today, but maybe next time I'm on Jimmy Fallon. Thank you so very much, ladies and gentlemen, for being here. Thank you so much for having me.